Is evolution fact or theory? What are the weakest aspects of evolutionary thought? Does it really make any difference whether a Christian believes in special creation or evolution? And what is the relationship between the creation story in the Bible and end time Bible prophecy? For the answer to these and other questions concerning the origin of life, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I are blessed to have as our special guest again this week a great creation teacher by the name of Mike Riddle. He is the founder and director of a wonderful ministry called the Creation Training Initiative. Mike, welcome back to Christ in Prophecy. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, folks, uh, this is our second week to interview Mike. If you missed our program last week when we talked with him about the age of the earth and the veracity of the Genesis account of creation, you can find that program on our website at lamblion.com. That's lamblion.com. Mike, this week we want to talk with you about uh, evolution. And uh, I know you prefer to call that evolutionism. Maybe you can describe why you you feel that way. But uh, Nathan, why don't you kick off with the first question? Okay, well let's start with the most important what is the strongest argument against evolution? I love that question because it just opens it up to the every area of science. <laughs> <laughs> the strongest. <laughs> because one of the things I start off with, a lot of people say the battle between God's Word, the Bible, and science. No, it is not. Because who created all the scientific principles? God did. And He's not in a battle with Himself. So true science will always support God's Word and refute evolutionism. Well, let me get some of the favorite ones I use. The first one is called the origin of the universe. Where did the matter come from to create the universe? Because we all know from good science and logic, from nothing, nothing comes. <laughs> <laughs> so that that question right there is a killer to the evolution model. Because you don't get that if you can't get that first piece of matter, you've got nothing. Mm-hmm. But here's one of my other favorite ones: the origin of life. I love that one. Why? Well, let's just take the cell. Start with the cell. One cell, we got about 60 trillion of these in our body, is more complex than any machine. 60 any trillion? Ever. Right, 60 trillion. Did you know that's greater than the national debt right now? <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, <so. laughs> okay. but 60 trillion cells. And mm-hmm. each cell is more complex than any machine mankind's ever made. But we don't have to talk about the cell. Let's just talk about one single protein. Okay. Not the DNA or anything, just a single protein. Our best scientists in the world cannot produce one single protein. And they come up with all these explanations. But here's the killer. Life cannot start in the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere because oxygen destroys chemical bonds. So if there was oxygen in the atmosphere, life could never begin. So what they teach in our schools is this. The atmosphere was different back then. There was no oxygen. Well, that's wonderful too because if we take away all the oxygen, we have no ozone because it's made out of oxygen. And uh-huh. folks, if we don't have an ozone, those ultraviolet rays come down and fry all life. Everything's dead. So now what they're saying is life started way down deep in the ocean. <laughs> so the sunlight could not reach. And I think, wow, what a wonderful idea. But there's a process of water called hydrolysis. One of those fancy words. Hydro meaning water. Hydrolysis literally means water splitting. Water, we need to survive. But it is one of the worst places in the universe for life to begin. Hmm. So life cannot start with or without oxygen, and it cannot start in water. And then we look at just the structure of a, of a, a proton, protein. We have hands left and right, and our left and right hands are made up of the same things, four fingers and a thumb. But they're not quite the same, because you put one hand behind the other, you notice your thumb and fingers are on opposite sides. <laughs> <laughs> amino acids, these are things that make up our proteins, amino acids. They also come in two shapes we call left and right-handed. Oh. And they are mirror images of each other, just like our hands. Well, here's the situation. Every amino acid in all biological proteins and all life is left-handed. Hmm. But the natural tendency, when we let it go by itself, is always to bond left and right. Our best scientists in the world, every experiment we've ever done, always ends up with left and right-handed amino acids, which is 
about like death. It's a poisoned life. But life requires 100% left-handed amino acids. And I'd like to point out right there a scripture, Romans 1, 19 and 20. God has given us all the evidence we need for believing in Creator, and no one has an excuse. And I believe this is one of the great examples right there. Life cannot start by naturalistic processes. And I think that's a powerful, powerful tool for people to use. Well, I'm surprised you didn't mention the argument that most people use, and that is the argument that, uh, of design. Design. Well, this comes under design there. And we could go days and days on just design. I mean, no, I, 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 all my life I wanted to see Mount Rushmore. All yes. my life. And I finally, at our 50th wedding anniversary, my wife and I went to South Dakota and I saw Mount Rushmore. And it was created by the wind, wasn't well, it? Well, I, I just stood there <laughs> and I together. thought, you know, isn't it amazing what can be accomplished accidentally by erosion? You know, when you have something that's designed, you have to have a designer. Right. Uh -huh. When you look at every creature, every animal, every creature, you see incredible design in there that defies evolution. And if I were to say that Mount Rushmore were created accidentally by erosion, a scientist would say I was insane. Exactly. And yet he turns around and says the whole universe happened accidentally. Right. You take a look at our computers. They didn't happen by accident, but they're nothing compared to the human body. There has to be a designer. Yes. Well, Romans 1.20 says that, for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what has been made. As a result, people are without excuse. We have yes. no excuse for denying a creator. Exactly. And at the time that uh, uh, Darwin wrote his book, he even talked about the complexity of the human eye. But that was before they, they had uh, 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 microbiology and all of the things that we have now. And he was just sure that, that science would ultimately prove all this. And it seems that the more, we get to, more science we get, the more evidence we have against evolution. Right. And then actually the best evidence against evolution is God's Word itself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because that's a supernatural. It's never changed. There is a lot of science in the Bible. And it's never had to change. But our science <laughs> textbooks, we keep updating, don't we? Yeah. Well, you talk about a lot of science in the Bible, and that's true. The Bible talks about how the earth is round. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yet they call us flat earth people if we believe, uh, you know, in, right. in creation. But here's another one. <laughs> Morality. What's the difference between good and evil? How do you determine something's good or something's evil? Yeah. To ask the evolutionists that, they really don't have an answer. They cannot give a universal definition of what is evil and what is good. Because they talk about, well, maybe it's my opinion. Well, everybody has different opinions. Or it's what society believes. Well, different societies have different values. But only the Bible gives a universal definition. God commands us to be perfect. But you know what? We're not perfect, are we? But he gave us a solution how to be perfect. And that's his son, Jesus Christ. So he gives the definition. He declares what is good and evil. He declares we have to be perfect. And he provides a solution for being perfect. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion of creation with our special guest, Mike Riddle. Mike, let me uh, ask you about uh, DNA. I mean, DNA is so complex, yeah. as I understand it. Even Bill Gates has said it's more complex than anything he's ever been able to program. Uh, how can... How can a person continue to believe in evolution with the evidence of DNA? Well, first of all, the discovery of DNA and what we know about DNA has demolished evolution. But the problem is that's not being told in the school system, in the education system. They're being told a whole different story about DNA and, and how it supports evolution, but it doesn't. See, the mechanism for evolution, how it works, is we're supposed to get random mutations. Then through a series of random mutations... There's a selection process mm -hmm. that selects only the beneficial ones. Well, there's some problems with that that's not, that are not being told. First of all, mutations do not add new genetic information. Yeah. They mm -hmm. tend to take things away or maybe keep it neutral at best, but they have never been known to create new information. Now, we talk about information. Let's just take a look at one DNA molecule, just one DNA molecule. When we compare that to our modern hard drives we have in mm -hmm. our computers, the compactness of the information, one DNA molecule, is over 5 billion, that's with a B, more compact, times more compact than a hard drive that we have today. Wow. That's <laughs> incredible. So where did that vast amount of information come from? And I'd like to give you, well, this is one of my best examples that I think really supports design in a creator God, the monarch butterfly. I love that thing. 
Now, monarch butterfly starts off as a tiny, tiny little worm there. That's the technical term, larvae. And in about 20 days, it grows to maturity, almost two inches long. That's right. Now, once it reaches maturity, it finds a special leaf and builds a silk pad on the bottom there. And then it connects itself and hangs in a J position. Then after a while, you'll start to see this caterpillar start to move. And when it starts to move, it's going to build the chrysalis, and it builds it from the head back. That's not amazing yet. What happens next is amazing. Once that caterpillar's in that chrysalis, the entire caterpillar, except the heart, dissolves into a green liquid. Ooh. Now, let me ask you a question here. This would be like a homework assignment question. <laughs> Go home tonight, turn yourself into a green liquid. What are you going to do next? <laughs> That's it. You're done. Unless somebody who's all intelligent pre-programs information into your DNA so you can reassemble yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is called pre-programmed information. Even if evolution worked, it can't do that. Because if evolution worked, it can only work for the here and now. It cannot see into the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the monarch butterfly is a great case of design intelligence of a creator. So basically you're, you're saying that, that the DNA has demolished evolution as a theory, and yet people cling to it because they close their eyes to the they, evidence. They close their eyes, and also because they're not being taught the truth about what DNA is all Reminds about. Reminds me of that book that came out recently with the title, You Can Lead a Scientist to Evidence, But You Can't Make Him Think. That's right. We're not being taught critical thinking skills anymore. It, it, to me, it reminds me of Romans one twenty one. For though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense, and their senseless minds were darkened. They willfully wanted to be ignorant. Right. And one of the questions, I, one, what I like to teach is critical thinking skills. We yes. do that in our classes. Yes. And I give everybody three questions to ask when they're confronted with evolutionism. How do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? And are you making any assumptions? Well, speaking of observations, tell yes. us about the fossil record. Don't the foss doesn't the fossil record prove evolution? It, when you look in textbooks, it does prove evolution. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it certainly does. But here's another critical thinking question I just love, and I train our youth to ask this question. Because if you look in our textbooks, we see all these transitional fossils there. But here's the question. How much of that fossil was actually found, and how much was added in by the artist or assumptions? Because what we find are very few fragments of a lot of these fossils. The rest is just drawn what by artists. What amazing is they'll find one tooth, a yeah. tooth, and then an artist will draw this Neanderthal ape-looking person from one tooth. That's right. That's, That's been done. That's all imagination. That's been done. Yeah. When I was in seventh grade, we had a guy come in, put all these skulls on a table, and say, hey, look, this is the progression of humankind. And I asked him, I said, are those real, genuine skulls? He said, yes, yes, they are. They're real fossils. Not a single one of them was an actual fossil. No. They were artists plaster casting, yet he went in front of our class and told us that the fossil record proved it. But there's nothing in the fossil record. No. There's no transitional... No. Now, when we look at the fossils, yeah. uh, some of the things we find, I, I, I show this in one of our, my talks. What does a fossil turtle look like? Exactly like a turtle. A <laughs> bat, there's a bat that's supposed to be millions and millions of years old, this fossil bat. It looks exactly like a what bat What about today. a dog? A dog, they look like dogs. Have you ever found a dat? They haven't found those either. <laughs> but, you know, alligators go back hundreds of millions of years. Guess what they look like in their fossil record? Alligators. Every creature that's living today, if we can find their fossil, looks almost exactly like it is today. But here's another one. Fossil graveyards. Mm -hmm. These are graveyards where we find hundreds, sometimes thousands of creatures, different kinds of creatures, all buried and mangled together. And in some cases, dinosaurs buried with all different kinds of creatures. Now, how do fossils form? Well, they have to be buried rapidly by the sediments to keep the oxygen out and the scavengers out, or you know, it can become a fossil. Well, how do you get thousands of creatures? This is, these are places where we find fish, mammals, reptiles, all buried together. They don't all live in the same zones. And we find most all these fossil graveyards in sediments laid down by water. Uh -huh. So you don't become a fossil graveyard by long, slow processes. It takes a catastrophic event. And we find these fossil graveyards all over the world, which is a great indicator of a worldwide flood. Well, I was going to say, I read one time where a writer said the, the, the fossil record is not really a record of historical ages. It's a record of an event. Right. And that is a worldwide flood. Exactly. It okay. just screams of a worldwide flood. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, we discussed earlier the gap theory and how people had tried to use that to 
to adjust the Bible to science. Mm -hmm. But there's another way they try to do it, and that's called theistic evolution. Yes. Uh, and many who ha who have the uh, believe in theistic evolution also believe in a gap theory. But what is theistic evolution? What are the problems with well, that? Well, theistic evolution is the idea that God used some form or forms of evolution during His creative process. And I hear this statement a lot of times: God could have used evolution. Wrong statement to make for a Christian. <laughs> it's not a matter of what God could have done; yeah. it's a matter of what did He do, and it's in the Bible. But here's some problems. The, the commonality to all the theistic evolution models, which could be the days of creation, could be long periods of time, yes. which the Bible does not teach, nor does science support. The gap theory. Mm -hmm. There's a one called the framework hypothesis, where Genesis is just poetic, not meant to be taken as real history. And there's other forms out there. But they all have one basic thing in common, and that is the idea of billions of years. Well, again, if we add billions of years into the Bible... That is clearly teaching death before sin. Because okay. what happens in those billions of years is death, decay, and disease. And that would all happen before sin. So if death was already there before sin, why did Jesus Christ have to go to the cross and shed his blood and die and conquer physical death? We lose our foundation for the gospel. And here's another one. Genesis 131. God looks back on his entire creation and calls it very good. Uh -huh. If we've already had billions of years of death, decay, and disease, including cancer, we find that in the bones, God just called cancer very good. That's what theistic evolutionists adopt. That's a good point. That is yeah, a very good point. Right. Nathan, uh, you had, uh, I think, a question about uh, uh, historical records. Yeah, we were, we were talking. Uh, you look in the Bible, and obviously it goes back thousands of years. We go back most human records, if not, I'd say, let me say all. All human records only go back a few thousand years. If we have millions of years, why, why don't we see a book from 100,000 years ago or a cave painting or something that's really old? Well, you're almost answered, you almost really answered the question, if we had millions of years, we would. <laughs> okay, but since go. we don't have millions of years, we don't see it. Yes. <laughs> but, yes, when we look at just like language itself, what we call the oldest or earliest languages are very complicated. Very complicated. They just start. They don't start they simple languages. Grunts language. and ooh, ooh. <laughs> yeah, and these people. Yes, they didn't go with grunts. We only do that when we're watching television. <laughs> but when we look back at people, these people were not dumb back then. These were very smart people. You look at Adam and Eve, the things they did. And I'd, one of my studies I did was ancient Egyptian mathematics, and the people that building the pyramids were using calculus. They were very smart people back then. They just didn't have the modern technology we have today with computers. Very smart, very intelligent, lived a long time, and accumulated a vast amount of knowledge. But yes, the records only go back to about the time right after the flood. Because the flood, what was the purpose of the flood? Destroy all of mankind. Mm -hmm. And he did that. Mm -hmm. So our records will only go back to about the time of the flood, which is about 45, 4,600 years ago. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview with Mike Riddle regarding the creation story in Genesis chapter 1. Mike, I have a question for you. Okay. Carbon-14 dating, all these dating techniques you hear about from evolutionists prove that the earth is millions of years ago. I hear many pastors and preachers say carbon-14 dating has proved that the earth is millions of years old. What do you have to say about that? Well, first problem is we've got a lot of people talking about the age of the earth who've never really been to the labs and see how these dating methods really work. And the first thing we need to understand is every one of these dating methods, we call them radiometric dating or okay. radioactive. That's what we're talking about, how one element changes to another. Things change. We get older, we change. For instance, put a banana out there. What happens to it? Yeah. It turns brown, and it's mm -hmm. only good for making banana bread at that point. So things change, and elements do too. One element will change into another over time. Now, the key part here is every one of these dating methods is based on assumptions. Okay. And they're not mentioned in the textbooks. And we have actually shown every one of these assumptions to be faulty, in error. So if your premise or your assumption is false, your conclusion will also be in error. And that's not being taught. I'll give you some examples. Lava flows in New Zealand were dated at 275,000 years old, when in actuality those lava flows were made in 1949. <laughs> we're a pretty big error there. Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, Helens right? very good. 1980, May 1980, these rocks were formed, lava flows. And they, it also created a canyon that looked like Grand Canyon. Right. Overnight. Overnight. <laughs> but these rocks that created in 1980 were dated at over 2 million years old. Whenever we know when a rock was formed, 
we never get the correct age. So why would we trust it when we don't know the rock was formed? And the other thing is, you can go to these labs, and you can take one rock sample, date it by four different methods. There's a lot of different methods we use, and come up with four very different ages, ranging from hundreds of millions of years of difference in age. So they're basically not reliable. And you mentioned carbon-14. The simple thing about carbon-14, after about 80,000 years, all the datable carbon-14 is decayed out of something. So hmm. if we find something with carbon-14 in it, it means it has to be, any datable carbon-14 has to be younger than 80,000 years. Well, let's go to coal. The Institute for Creation Research did some studies on this. And they took these coal samples. Now, according to evolution, coal is millions of years old. It should have no carbon-14 in it. But they took it to the evolutionist lab to make sure there'd be no bias. Guess what they found in every coal sample? Carbon-14. <laughs> that won't get published. Then they did the next study, diamonds. Now, diamonds are a very special kind of stone because they're made up of pure carbon. Mm -hmm. Now, diamonds are supposed to be hundreds of billions to billions of years old. There should be no carbon-14 in those things. But they took these diamond samples to the lab, and guess what they found in every diamond sample? Carbon-14. Carbon so mm. carbon-14 is a powerful testimony that this Earth has to be young. I'm also un under the impression that carbon-14 dating, for example, uh, one of its assumptions is there was never a worldwide flood. Right. Uh, the car there is an assumption behind carbon-14, <laughs> and that was proven false. The, r the inventor of carbon-14, Dr. Willard Libby, even noticed the assumption was false, <laughs> but he ignored it because of his belief in evolution. I've also been intrigued by uh, findings recently of uh, dinosaur uh, skeletons that actually contain soft matter in the bones. Right. And, and they're just supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old. Right. We're finding proteins, red blood cells, and tissue that's even stretchable that comes wow. back to then. And including, we're finding carbon-14 in their bones. Too. How can that be if they're hundreds of millions of years old? It can't be. But here's the best explanation we're hearing now. There's some unknown process that preserves tall tissue for millions oh, and millions of years. Oh. <laughs> That's what you call a rescue mechanism again, <laughs> not based on any observable science. Well, I want to go back to a fundamental question that we started with in the previous program, but I, I, it's so fundamental, I, I just want to end with it, and that is, what difference does it make, whether it took a billion years or it's 6,000 years? This is the best question to end on. Uh, why does it matter? And it comes back again to the authority of God's Word, Scripture. When do we believe it? When do we not believe it? See, the world looks at Christians. We're being looked at and see, are we really consistent in our beliefs? If we don't believe it, how can we tell other people to believe it? Mm -hmm. Let me give you a great example here, consistency. I love to ask this question. Do we as Christians really believe Jesus Christ died on that cross? And we'll say yes. But do we believe He rose again on the third day? And we'll say yes. And my question to that is, why do you believe that? You are not there to observe it. And the answer is God's Word. We believe it by faith. But let me add one more thing. Did you know, according to all known science, you cannot be dead for three days and come back to life? So are you still willing to go against known science and believe the resurrection? And we'll say yes. But then are you willing to believe that God created in six little days, as His Word says, even though our best scientists can't do that? The world sees this. And they see Many Christians say, I believe the resurrection, but I don't believe in the creation. And they see that inconsistency in there. Mm -hmm. We have become, in the church, a stumbling block for people accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because we don't accept it. But well, the other end. You know, one of, one of my things that I've, I've taught for many years is that uh, we need to accept God's Word for what it says right. from the beginning to the end. Exactly. If the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense or you'll end up with nonsense. Just right. it, God knows how to communicate. He wants to communicate. You yes. don't have to have a Ph.D. in hermeneutics or you imagination. Mm -hmm. You do have to have the Holy Spirit residing in you to understand all of God's yes. Word. And uh, I've often made the point that there's a tremendous uh, a relationship between the beginning of the Bible and the end of the Bible. Yes. If you start off spiritualizing mm -hmm. the story of creation, you will probably end up by spiritualizing what the Bible teaches about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Exactly. And, and to me, you've got to take both of them for what they say. Yeah, They go hand in hand. What we lose in Genesis, <laughs> we get back again in the book of Revelation. Yes. It's amazing the correlation between those two books. That's right. And, and they need to be approached from the yes. viewpoint that, that, that they're understandable, that God wants you yes. to understand. You know, uh, uh, when uh, Henry Morris the founder of the Institute for Creation Research, wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. 
he started out by saying, I'm writing this commentary because people say that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. They're wrong. Mm -hmm. He said, it's not hard to understand. It's hard to believe. Yes. If you will believe it, you will understand That's it. Right. Same true of the Genesis story. Exactly. But isn't that the same with evolution? We base our belief in God on faith. But does not evolution also it's it a faith system. It's a religion. Ultimately, both have to be accepted by faith. faith. Ultimately do. Right. Then it comes down to a matter of this. Again, what does your faith have to offer you? Your faith in evolution offers me nothing. Because when I say, who am I? Are we just a chance accident? Or are we made in the image and likeness of God? Freedom to sin, right? And then it comes down to the ultimate question. What happens when we die? Right. And do Dave I just Hunt become nothing? this way. He said... Can you stop and think for a moment about what is the greatest hope of an atheist? The greatest hope is that there is nothing after death. Right. Exactly. And our hope is we're going to live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview with Mike Riddle. Mike, would you mind telling our audience how they can get in touch with your ministry? Sure. If people want to learn more about our training courses where we come to your church and do these train, one-day training classes, they can go to our website, creationtraining.org. That's all one word, creationtraining.org. And they can get on your newsletter. Yes, they can. And they can find out about all the resources that you have That's put correct. out there. Well, folks, I hope you will go to that website, and I hope you will Try to get Mike invited to your church to conduct one of these seminars. That's our program for this week. Until next week, the Lord willing, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Nathan Jones and myself saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you enjoyed today's program, you will love Mike Riddle's Apologetics 101. This DVD is specially for a man to short segments for Houston Christian schools, Sunday school classes, and Bible studies. It'll challenge you to prepare for the tough questions facing Christians today. Get your answers to questions like, How could Adam name all the animals in one day? How could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? How can the first three days of creation be considered days when the sun was not even created until day four? Where did Cain get his wife? What about carbon-14 dating? And more. This DVD will provide you and your family with the responses to these challenging Bible questions. Apologetics 101 is available for a donation of $15 or more, plus shipping. Order your copy today by calling the number you see on the screen, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, or order online at lamblion.com. And when you order this item, we will send you a complimentary copy of Dr. Reagan's video album, The Beginning and the Ending. Christ in Prophecy is made possible through the faithful and generous support of viewers like you. Please consider making a donation to Lamb and Lion Ministries so that we can continue broadcasting the message of Jesus' soon return. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 